move on to the second part of the methodology, which is basically um, string method slash bias exchange on verbal sampling. So you have generated a good pathway, and now you want to optimize the pathway, refine your pathway, and then sample around the pathway to get the free energy. Before that, I just want to talk a little bit about the uh, orientation quaternion because this is the collective variable that I've been using in most of these for most of these proteins, and also uh, that's the collective variable that is in the tutorial. Uh, and it's a very useful one because um, it allows you to change the orientation of things in a, a very flexible manner. You decide how you want to rotate different domains in the protein. And it does that in a very smooth way. And one thing that I realized after I started working with them was the fact that the orientation quaternion is consistent with the Riemannian geometry. And at that point, I started reformulating the free energy calculation techniques and the pathfinding algorithms within the Riemannian framework because uh, of certain advantages that I will mention at the towards the end of my talk today. But the orientation quaternion and there was the, the way that it's implemented in the Colvars module of NAMD is actually consistent with the Riemannian geometry and Riemannian definitions of everything because the way the distance is defined in the orientation space. So what is orientation quaternion? It's basically a mathematical tool to find the best rotation to basically superimpose two structures on top of each other. And this is what you typically do before you calculate RMSD. If you are doing the best with RMSD, you need to align them first before you calculate the RMSD. And orientation quaternion is one of the algorithms to do that. Um, so it's already implemented in uh, a lot of codes that do RMSD calculation, not all of them. In the Colvars module, the RMSD calculation is also based on this. But you can also use the orientation quaternion and some of its derivatives directly. So you don't have to use the RMSD collective variable, you can use the orientation collective variable. What it does is it, it basically defines the orientation of a domain of the protein, for instance, with respect to a reference structure as your collective variable. And you can change that then, or you can restrain that. Uh, if you want to restrain the orientation of two domains with respect to each other, or if you want to change the orientation of two domains with respect to each other, orientation quaternion allows you to do that. It's the orientation in the Colvars module. And there are also some other related collective variables like orientation angle, which unlike orientation, which is a four-dimensional object, and I don't call it a vector because uh, it's, orientation is not, a, or quaternions are not vectors, they are quaternions, which is a generalization of the complex numbers. So it's like a complex number with three uh, imaginary components rather than one. So mathematically, they are not vectors, but they are four component objects. And orientation quaternion is a unit quaternion. So there are three degrees of freedom here because the unit, the, 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 the absolute value of the quaternion is always one for orientation quaternions. So, but there are other uh, collective variables related to that, like orientation angle, which is a one dimensional one, which is only the angle between two domains or between a domain with respect to its um, reference. Um, spin angle, tilt angle, things like that. And you can see that in the Colvars module manual, what they mean. Um, so the orientation quaternion would look like this. Cosine of theta half, sine of theta half u. Uh, 
axis of rotation, and theta is the angle of rotation. So if you have your uh, reference structure, uh, and then you have another structure which is like sitting like this, then the axis of rotation would be something like this, and the angle of rotation would be here. But um, that can be changed. So you can, in a time-dependent manner, in a pulling SMD simulation, uh, you can change that. You can move the domain in a particular manner, in a particular direction, with the orientation quaternion. And there are some more information in the tutorial also. If you do the tutorial for this uh, talk this afternoon, and there is some more information about it, and it gives you some um, ways of uh, basically um, determining how to get your initial value for the quaternion and your final value for the quaternion and so on. But the nice thing about quaternions is that the biasic potential, which is a harmonic potential for uh, SMD and for umbrella sampling, uh, is defined in a way which is consistent with the Riemannian definition. Um, and that is because usually you have one half k distance squared. In this case, the distance between two quaternions is the geodesic distance. And there is an approximate value for the geodesic distance. Uh, this omega here is the geodesic distance between a quaternion and another quaternion. And the dot product of the two quaternions um, basically gives you the cosine of the geodesic distance. So in other words, the arc cosine of the dot product of two quaternions is an approximation for the geodesic distance between two quaternions. And you can use this geodesic distance between the two quaternions as a distance in your definition of your harmonic potential. And it's already the way that is implemented in NAMD. So if you are using uh, SMD in, in Colbert's module, I would say. Uh, if you are using SMD or you are using umbrella sampling or, with, or, or any other method with the orientation quaternion, the way the distances are defined are based on geodesic distances like this. And this formula is not an exact. The omega here, which is the geodesic distance, is not. Uh, this is not an exact formula. It's an approximation, but it's a very good approximation. And because of that, makes this collective variable consistent with the Riemannian uh, formalism. So uh, this is a. Uh, very powerful and very useful collective variable to use. Yeah. Sorry, did this Q wrap that the initial position? Uh, this is a any, uh, any position. So if you have a um, set of coordinates, right, uh, and then you have a reference structure, which right. is y k here, and the the quaternion gives you the best uh, the best way of rotating your x set to align with the y, and uh, that changes by time. If, if you're running a trajectory and x changes by time, the value of q is going to change by time. So, so that's the observed quaternion. But the big q of t is like your final state you're trying to reach. This is uh, any, any quaternion that you want to either restrain the system in a time-dependent or time-independent manner. So if it's a pulling simulation, this is going to be time-dependent. You start from some quaternion value, and then you go to another quaternion value. Uh, if it's a restraining simulation, like what you do in umbrella sampling, then it's going to be a fixed number. It's not time-dependent anymore. So you can do whatever you want with this. And then this is also coming from your actual confirmation at any given time. And this is the distance. This omega here is the distance between the target value at time t, uh, the restraining center at time t, and the actual value of orientation quaternion at uh, time t as well. And the distance here is, of course, not a 
Cartesian distance is, this is basically a measure of how different the two quaternions are. <clears throat> um, so if you are doing, uh, again, pulling, uh, this is how it's implemented in the covariance module. Um, because quaternions are um, units, uh, sorry, orientation quaternions are unit quaternions. So typically, if you are doing linear interpolation, it is consistent with this. So you are going to see what is your next center at time t plus delta t, and you have your center at q uh, at time t. <clears throat> So, and you have also a final target that you want to reach at time big T. So you are going from some point to another point. This is your final target at time big T. And this is your current target at time T. And you want to know where should be the next quaternion. And this is already implemented. This is just, I'm just uh, basically um, giving you the ways implemented because there are several ways of changing the protocol. This is only one way, and that's the way it's implemented in whole virus module. So this is a linear interpolation. Like any other collective variable which is linearly interpolated in whole virus module. But because of the normalization, because you need to normalize it after you interpolate it. Then it's not a linear interpolation anymore. So or orientation quaternion is then not linearly interpolated. If you plot the orientation quaternion, uh, you shouldn't expect to see a linear change because of this nonlinear nature that you see. So this is how the uh, SMD with quaternion, <coughs> orientation quaternions work. And there are some more things that you can calculate about. This is about the in, uh, implementation that the uh, time derivative of potential, the, par the partial time derivative of potential is an important thing in SMD simulations. Because the way you calculate non-equilibrium work is by integrating over that. So the work, the non-equilibrium work or the accumulated work, accumulated work or accumulative work it's actually defined based on an integral over the time, the partial time derivative of potential. So this uh, partial time derivative of potential uh, is calculated um, for the orientation quaternion. The way the protocol is, that I explained in the previous slide, because it's interpolated this way. So with that interpolation, the time derivative of potential becomes something like this. So it becomes complicated, but it's already there. You don't have to deal with it unless you want to do uh, something of, uh, on your own. But generally, um, you do not need to do any of this. So what you need to know about the orientation quaternions is typically uh, just this formula, the very first formula, that if you have a quaternion, the first element gives you the cosine of theta half, and theta is the angle, the orientation angle. And this u is your axis. So you need to know this formula to be able to uh, generate your initial and final covariate centers if you want to use SMD. Okay, now that uh, I, I gave this uh, brief overview of quaternions, now I'm going to move on to the second part of the methodology, which is the iterative combination of free energy calculation methods and path finding algorithms. So the stuff that I'm going to talk about, they have been covered in this workshop before, um, I believe. Uh, the string method, the replica exchange umbrella sampling, and there are tutorials for them. Um, I have a different version of string method and umbrella sampling with replica exchange. I call it by sequence exchange umbrella 
umbrella sampling using the same NAMD TCL scripting capabilities and the multiple copy simulations. Uh, I have the same, uh, you know, I'm using the same capabilities, but it's a slightly different script that I've generated with a particular interface for the user to be able to use kind of arbitrary collective variables and then use um, certain types of one-dimensional or two-dimensional or uh, more arbitrary uh, networks for umbrella sampling. So in, in your string method, you can use any set of collective variables and um, you start with an initial pathway with multiple copies of each image. And it's very similar to the, to the uh, stuff that you can find in the other uh, string method, TCL script, that also has a tutorial. It's just a different, it's an independent implementation of mine. Uh, and uh, it does similar things. But uh, if you want to use this uh, tutorial, then you can actually use that code, use that script, and use the interface that I have provided with, for it. And uh, it simplifies things to a great extent, I believe. But you can try it and see if you like it or not. Um, so I will just talk a little bit about, about the string method and bisex string umbrella sampling, because um, it's uh, what, imp what is implemented, and you, you need to uh, be reminded if you want to do the tutorial. And uh, also, I'm going to talk about, uh, about these, because then, uh, for the, the type of analysis that uh, I'm suggesting to do, we need to make sure that we are using the same language. So I will talk very briefly about them. So string methods, there are several different types of string methods, and they all basically do uh, try to optimize your pathway. So we start with an initial pathway, and then they try to find the minimum free energy path. So uh, pathway is represented by a string of uh, points in a collective variable space or Cartesian space. So again, in my implementation of the string method, uh, you can use any set of collective variables, and then your string is going to be represented by points in that space. Uh, and then the string is going to be iteratively updated. And there are different rules for doing this, and there are different versions of the string method because of that. And some of them may not even be called a string method, but this is a general idea, and there are uh, uh, various papers that describe very similar string method uh, type calculations. So we kind of update them based on some rules, and there is always some reparameterization involved. And in reparameterization, you uh, try to keep them uh, in an equidistant manner from each other, and uh, then you go to the next uh, iteration. So for a string method with sorts of trajectories, um, it's again a similar thing. The difference is the rule, the way that you are generating the new centers for the string, and that is using the sorts of free trajectories. So uh, at any point, you run several free short simulations, and then you average the centers, and that's your new center. Then you do some reparameterization again to make them equidistant, and you keep going. So in uh, my uh, code for the string method, my TCL script for the string method, uh, you can do this in parallel. Like you have uh, a number of images, say 50 images, and then you have a number of copies for each image, say 20 images per image. So you're, you're going to need uh, 50 times 20, uh, 1,000 uh, copies of the system to run at the same time. And uh, you can also do this in a sequential manner for each image. So instead of having um, 20 copies of each image, you only have one copy of each image. But you restrain, you release, you restrain, you release. And at the end of the 20 uh, iterations, now you have 20 samples, and you can average. And that's when you update your center. Um, you can also do this 
in a com com in a hybrid manner. You can have, for instance, five copies and sample each copy four times to get the 20 number. You can do it that way as well. So uh, depending on your uh, supercomputer that you are using, uh, you may choose uh, the the number of copies that you want to simulate. And then based on that, also choose the number of samples that you want to, to have. But eventually, you cannot use just a few um, samples for each image, because it's supposed to average, it's, it's supposed to be an ensemble average. And five is not a good a number for averaging. So uh, you can actually try different numbers, but something like 20, 30, something like that might, might work. Um, and you can, again, decide based on your architecture how you want to do it with the number of copies and number of samples. Yeah. How long are your image simulations? Yeah, so the, the, that's, a, that's a good question, and there is no good answer for it, I would say. So uh, some things I did, I actually tried different, um, different times, different basically delta t's. And um, I did that for a dialimine peptide. And it turns out that depending on what delta T you choose, you get a different pathway. And so I would say that's not something that, you know, it's, it's based on the uh, certain assumptions. And uh, one of the uh, issues is actually, uh, let me actually talk about this because it's very much related to this. So string method with storms of trajectories actually doesn't give you the minimum free energy pathway. This is uh, something that we should know. And this was uh, shown very directly here. I mean, it's not difficult to, to understand it because if you just look at the uh, formulas, you see that the string method with storms of trajectory is actually uh, tries to make this zero, the drift term zero, along the path. And the drift term is not just the free energy. So if you assume there is a diffusion tensor for your collective variable space, and there is no particular reason that this diffusion tensor has to be isotropic, and there is no particular reason that this diffusion tensor has to be position independent, so generally, this diffusion tensor for your collective variable space is a, an, an, an isotropic um, uh, position-dependent diffusion tensor. And because of that, this term exists, and also this term exists. And what it means is uh, string method is going to uh, make sure that this term is zero along the path. So the system is drifting only along the path. That's what the string method is going to guarantee if it converges. So the zero drift path is not the same as the minimal free energy path. Because the minimal free energy path is the one that actually follows this. And it's not a bad thing, necessarily. Um, and because the diffusion tensor is a physically meaningful thing, and it means something. So the minimum free energy path is not necessarily the best path. Uh, if you do consider the fact that there is also a diffusion tensor involved. <clears throat> and uh, that's why I actually uh, kind of try to uh, get rid of, because diffusion tensor is, um, is uh, something difficult to work with and diff difficult to understand. And uh, one thing that they tried to do that I will mention at the end um, is I try to actually get rid of the diffusion tensor. Now, I mean, you can of course get rid of it and assume that it doesn't exist, but I'm not talking about that. So what I try to do, I try to reformulate the diffusion equation in a way that instead of a diffusion tensor, we have a metric tensor. And if you have a metric tensor, and metric tensors are for me, at least, are more understandable than the diffusion tensors. And there is a big field of Riemannian geometry uh, that knows what to do with diffusion, with, with metric tensors. So if you 
can kind of get rid of the diffusion tensors, then this formula becomes a lot simpler. Your metric goes inside these gradients that you see here, because instead of using the Cartesian formula for gradient, then use the Riemannian formula for gradient, or for Laplacian, and so forth. So it doesn't provide you with the MFDP, right? This one, yes. yes. But do you agree with Albert Pan when he says that it's Albert Pan when they say that it provides you uh, most probable condition. Um, uh, with certain conditions, yeah. So I, I was actually trying to say that it is true that it doesn't give you the minimum free energy path, but it's not a bad thing because, of course, if the transition tube is very thin and all that, yeah, it does give you the most probable path. I mean, with certain assumptions. So I would say that it does give you the most probable path, but again, it doesn't give you um, an invariant path. So I have a different, actually, approach that gives you an invariant path, which is actually even better than this one. So the, the fact that you call it most probable is a little misleading, I would say, because uh, most probable um, if, if, it's in, in, if, it's, if it's not invariant, if by doing a, com, a, a, a coordinate transformation you get a different pathway, how do you call, how do you call it most probable, probable? Which one is going to be most probable? Is this one going to be most probable or the other one going to be most probable? So the, uh, the problem with this formulation is that Neither of these two terms are invariant. So if you do a coordinate transformation, both of these terms is going to, um, both of them are going to change. They are going to be different in a different uh, coordinate system. So the Riemannian reformulation that I'm talking about still gives you two different terms, but those two terms are not the same as these. And one of them is going to be invariant under any coordinate transformation. And the other one is going to be coordinate system dependent. I think the first term, uh, which I will show in a little bit, uh, which is, time, uh, which is uh, invariant, is the most interesting path to study because it's invariant under coordinate transformations. It's an actual pathway which does not change if you change your coordinate transformation. So the most probable path um, is not incorrect because there is actually a, a way of justifying it. Um, that means that if you, in, in this particular, um, if you project your pathway in this particular space, that is going to be the most probable path. But the, the whole problem with it is the fact that I think we are, we are just using the wrong framework. Because the collective variable spaces are, are not Euclidean spaces. And the fusion tensor is not the best way of describing them. So it, it, mess, it kind of uh, makes things very difficult to, to understand. Now, the way that I understand the pro problem is the string method doesn't give you the best path. It could provide you information about the best path if you analyze it. Uh, but it doesn't give you the, the best and the most interesting path. The most interesting path is the minimum free energy path, but not the free energy as defined with the Cartesian and Euclidean uh, geometry. The best uh, and the most interesting and the most probable path is the minimal free energy path when free energy is defined using the Riemannian geometry, considering the metric tensor. Yeah. Could you define uh, briefly Riemannian geometry? Uh, yes, I have it in a little bit. Yeah, I think we kind of, I, I kind of went ahead of uh, myself because I wanted to talk about it 
more rigorously in a little bit. I just wanted to introduce these things and see and show you the problem with it. So there is a problem with it, and the, the main problem is free energy itself is not invariant under coordinate transformation. We know how to deal with it. I'm not saying that it's not uh, it's 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 not informative. It is informative, and we know how to transform it. Um, this pathway is also not invariant under coordinate transformation. But the idea is, what if we reformulate things in a way that free energy becomes invariant under coordinate transformations? So it becomes a real thing, real physical thing, not dependent on any coordinate system that you use. And also, if that's the case, if your free energy is invariant, then your free energy, minimum free energy path is going to be invariant under coordinate transformation as well. So that becomes a real physical pathway, which is not dependent on how you define your coordinate space. And I'll talk about that in a little bit. Uh, but uh, the, this was just a very brief. Oh, yeah. I'm, so, I'm sorry. Yeah. But, but so whether it's the most interesting path, mm -hmm. or the most probable transition path, or minimum free energy path. Uh, if you look at the potential mean force that you, that you obtain, when you calculate along this path, this row, uh, they still do respect the, uh, the, the, the conductor. Uh, I mean, they still have, uh, when you calculate the conductor distribution, in principle, at the top of the barrier, you should get one half, and you should be. Well, you should have an isometer. Um, yeah, so how, um, but uh, I, I actually argue that you wouldn't. Oh, you wouldn't? Yeah. If, if you are using the string method with storms, I, I, I can actually show that you wouldn't get the isocometer surfaces. Because it doesn't give you the minimum free energy. And yet they do. And yet they do. I mean, if you, if you look at the fan, the fan uh, sensor rule paper, Mm -hmm. uh, when they calculate the frame profile based on the string method response, mm -hmm. and they put themselves at the top of the barrier and they shoot X trajectories, uh, the computer distribution gives a uh, nice computer uh, surface. Yeah, because it could. It could. In, in principle, it doesn't. So mathematically speaking, it's actually easy to see that it doesn't necessarily give you that. Uh, anecdotally, you can find examples that it works. But just because this diffusion tensor here happens to be flat enough. But if this diffusion tensor is not flat enough, then it's not going to be the same. And this is not going to be the, the minimum free energy path to give you the isocommuter surfaces. Um, uh, so, uh, this is, uh, I think, uh, something that uh, the, these people actually showed first, that what's the problem with this. And they have done this in a, uh, you know, using some toy models and just show that. And I did the same thing. So I basically, I have used some toy models to show that this string method doesn't give you the, the, the right pathway, which actually agrees with the commuter, uh, with the commuter uh, definition. Uh, yeah, you have someone. Uh, that was kind of related to what you just sort of related to my question was, if it doesn't fall on an isocommittal surface, how do you know that the pathway that it gives you is actually the right, the, the role of the pathway? Uh, well, that, that's what I was trying to yeah. say, that this pathway is not the best path that you get. It's not a meaningless path. It's the zero. Uh, it's the zero drift path. It's the path that, in this particular coordinate space, if you look at it, uh, it doesn't. The, the trajectory doesn't drift away from the pathway. But um, I think that the right framework is the uh, an invariant framework when it's not coordinate system dependent. So, and again, umbrella sampling, you know, uh, you all know what uh, umbrella sampling is. But one thing that, if you use my scripts, um, you will see is that you can basically define your 
reaction coordinate as uh, basically a path. So it's not the same as the path collective variable that uh, you've heard uh, about, because it's not a one-dimensional collective variable. You have a multi-dimensional collective variable space. You just restrain your system uh, on certain points in this space, and then you do umbrella sampling, and you allow exchange between the, uh, the replicas and all that. And one thing that's possible to do in my uh, um, in my uh, implementation, is that uh, uh, let me. I mean, uh, you're you're familiar with all of these. You know how the uh, exchange rules are. Uh, this is basically bias exchange umbrella sampling. You look at the bias and uh, decide whether or not you should uh, change the uh, replica, move it from one center to the other, or change their centers. Um, but one thing that you can do with this uh, bias exchange umbrella sampling, uh, which is not in probably other uh, in the other implementations, is that it also allows you to have a very similar um, architecture for your simulation as the string method. So you have a number of images and a number of copies of each image. And these different copies can exchange between each other. So every point, uh, every image is represented by several copies that you choose. And these copies, they're all allowed to exchange with the neighboring copies. So you have a better chan chance of exchange between them because there are more copies. Um, but what is also good about it is if you are interesting, interested in having a good error estimate, these copies are basically independent from each other. So they provide you a very good way of doing um, error estimate. So if you are using bootstrapping, but if uh, you have only one trajectory per window or per, uh, per image, then um, you have to use the same trajectory for bootstrapping. But if you have multiple copies and they are basically independent from each other, you can actually use that within the bootstrapping context and have completely independent samples from each other. So you don't even need to worry about the autocorrelation anymore because these are independent from each other. But if they're not completely independent in the sense that we did allow exchange between them. So you are taking advantage of having multiple copies of images in two ways. First of all, you allow exchange between multiple copies. If you have only one long trajectory, you can only uh, allow exchange with one trajectory with its neighbor. So there is only one chance at, at a given time. But if you have multiple copies of each image, you have more copies to exchange in two given neighboring windows, and that gives you a better chance of exchange. And they also explore different parts of the configuration space in the dimensions orthogonal to your collective variable space. Those uh, orthogonal uh, degrees of freedom that uh, we always worry about can be sampled more if you have multiple copies rather than just one copy. But Especially when it comes to the uh, to the uh, free energy estimation, uh, the multiple copy uh, bias exchange umbrella sampling, and here by multiple copy I mean multiple copies of each image, it allows you to use, for instance, a Bayesian bootstrapping technique, and uh, I have uh, the implementation of it, which is available again with the tutorial as a standalone code that gets all the um, results of all the simulations that you have and uses something like the MBAR estimator for free energy and also do, does a uh, Bayesian bootstrapping with all these copies and gives you the error estimates. Now, if you don't have the resources to run them at the same time, you can also do this separately. Uh, just have one copy per image and run longer and then block them for the bootstrapping, for the Bayesian bootstrapping. 
For instance, you can have uh, 20 nanosecond per image and then block them in five nanosecond uh, pieces and then bootstrap using the Bayesian bootstrapping the whole thing. So if you have, for instance, 50 images and for image you have uh, 20 copies, although you don't really need 20, maybe you can go with like five or something. So you have five copies of, two, uh, of 50 images, then you can have 250 trajectories. And the Bayesian bootstrapping basically bootstrap, bootstraps the entire trajectories with each other. And if you have a long 20 nanosecond one, you can cut it in pieces, in five nanosecond pieces, and bootstrap that. Yeah. So for this five, six, seven, the broad sample, you have, you start multiple simulations on, in, on different windows, and then you have multiple replicas of each window, window, or do you just have like one replica for, or is like one replica uh, equal to one window? Uh, yeah, so window, uh, so okay, so uh, I'm using several terms here and I try to actually distinguish them in the tutorial. So window, umbrella, uh, image, uh, replica, copy, so these are all different terms. And uh, so replica, I, I call replica an actual trajectory. Uh, no matter if it's, if it, it's what its bias is, so that's a replica. And then it could, it could change its bias center, jumps between different different ones. So that's a that's a replica. Now, um, when you start the simulation, for each image, you can have multiple copies, and each copy would be a replica. So you have an actual five copies of each image, and it can come from the string methods that string method that you, you do this. So if you have done a string method, you have multiple copies already available for each image. You can transfer them directly for umbrella sampling simulations now. So it allows you to go directly from string method with swarms of trajectories to bias exchange umbrella sampling without changing the architecture and hierarchy of your simulations. Of course, this is only relevant if you have the resources to run all of these at the same time. Um, but it, it is advantages over running them, running a long one. Why? Because because of the two things that I said, it allows more exchange, and, and you know the the multiple copy thing is like basically you know multiple donkeys that I showed. So it's it's a good thing, and also it gives a good way of error estimate because what you use for bootstrapping are completely independent trajectories. So these trajectories are basically uh, can be considered completely independent for the bootstrapping purposes. You don't have to block your trajectory or worry about the autocorrelation time. Although autocorrelation time is always important for other reasons, but uh, it kind of uh, makes life a little easier. So this is the, uh, the umbrella, the bias exchange umbrella sampling scheme. And then for the, um, for the free energy estimation, I mentioned the M-bar formula. Um, my implementation is not actually based on M-bar, it's related to M-bar. Uh, I, I just simply call it non-parametric reweighting scheme, and it's based on uh, an older paper, but um, it's equivalent to M-bar. So um, the, the idea, I think you are familiar with the idea of BAM and weighted histogram analysis method, so I'm going to skip these to get to other uh, other things, but this is basically conventional VAM, and you kind of iteratively solve two things. You have those factors that you need to optimize, and you also have the um, probability of different, uh, basically, windows. And the generalization of this was uh, published in year 2000, which is an iterative solution of these two equations. And it's a non-parametric rewating scheme. So there is no need for histogramming. Now, why is this important? Because if you are working in a high dimensional collective variable space, histogram is just not the way to go. It just doesn't work. You know, build a histogram in you know 50 dimensions. So, but this allows you to avoid that problem. And uh, this is how I have implemented the um, the non-rewating uh, uh, sorry, non-parametric rewating scheme. 
And it gives you two things. It gives you something called the perturbed free energy of each window, which is uh, the same thing that uh, in the M-bar formula, well, I actually should just go to the next slide, um, that you have in the M-bar formula and also in Jarzinski's relation. So these are related to each other, uh, which is not the same as PMF. It's called the perturbed free energy, and um, you can find about that in the literature. So perturbed free energy uh, is not the same as the PMF, but the two of them become the same when the force constant that you're using on well sampling is very large. But then there are correction terms for it. You can go um, further and further. In. But uh, one thing that is uh, good to do is always to uh, use the, at least the first correction term to see whether or not it's a small. So, you know, you can always assume that your force constant is large, but there is a way, there is a relatively easy way to check that. Just do the correction of the um, PMF versus perturbed free energy that you can find in the literature and uh, see if it's small or not. So, if it's not small, that means that you may need actually higher correction terms and your PMF and your perturbed free energy are not the same things. So if you put these two equations uh, together, because they are solved iteratively, you end up with a basically um, transcendental equation, which is the M-bar. So M-bar is simply just, you can prove it from those two relations in one page. Just put them together to get M-bar. Um, so you can either iteratively solve this for F, which is um, free energy, the perturbed free energy, or you can solve these two equations uh, separately but iteratively. And what you get out of this code is the following. You get a free energy for each image or window, which is a perturbed free energy, and you also get a probability for every single sample that you have generated in your simulations. Now, what is that probability for? That probability is useful for doing any PMF calculations or any ensemble averaging in any given dimension. So uh, if you want to, uh, for instance, project the PMF in one of the collective variable uh, dimensions or in something that is not even one of the collective variables that you used in your simulations, you can do that with the uh, weighted histogram of um, uh, using these probabilities and whatever measure that you are going to build your PMF uh, based on. And uh, I, have a, I have an example that I will show you in a second. But uh, the perturbed free energy uh, is basically um, related to the partition function of the BIOS system. So when you are BIOSing your system, you add a restraining term here, which is going to be larger than the free energy itself, so it kind of dominates. Um, and the partition function of your BIOS system is going to give you the free energy. The partition function is related to the free energy. And this free energy, this is you can call it the perturbed free energy, which is not the same as the PMF, but is related to the PM. And one of the nice things about uh, the Riemannian formalism again is uh, I can show a, an exact relation between the PMF and the perturbed free energy, which is general for any dimensions. Uh, and, and I will show you, and show you that in a second. So using this strategy of doing string method with swarms of trajectories in the quaternion space, the orientation quaternion space. What does that mean? A every helix in your system is represented by an orientation quaternion. So if you have 12 helices, you're going to have 12 quaternions, and that represents your uh, collective variable space. And you do string method, um, and then you optimize that, and then you calculate free energies using uh, bias extreme general sampling, and you use the non-parametric curvating, use the perturbed free energy, you show the first correction term is a small, 
and this is what you get for the free energy, not just for the A-pole. So this is the transition between outward facing and inward facing A-pole, which is large, as we expected. Um, but also, you can get this for the substrate. And for the substrate, you need to have additional collective variables to represent the uh, binding and transport of the substrate. It could be just simply this, the, the, the Z uh, position of the, of, the, of the substrate. Or if your substrate is not very symmetric, you probably need to also have the orientation of the substrate and so on. And this looks actually very similar to what people typically draw, uh, just schematically. But now this is based on actual calculations. And now you can, using the, the weights or the probabilities that you get from non-parametrically weighting for every sample, you can project this on any space. So this is the a particular, particular two-dimensional space, I call it quaternion principal component. So this is like a principal component analysis, DCA, but using the quaternion instead of using the atomic positions, you can do that. And you get two, the first and second uh, PCs of the quaternions. So you get something like this, you project this, you do reweighting based on the weights that you got, and you kind of get this picture, you have a pathway, and you see that it's not that thin. So there's always this assumption that the transition tube has to be thin for having all these uh, equations work right. So it's not that thin. So it is actually uh, uh, an issue that needs to be taken into consideration. So that's something that we can check. So uh, we, should, we can project our our pathways that we sample, our transition tubes that we sample and see whether or not they are thin or not. And if they are not thin, then there are features, like you see there are features here that um, may not be sampled very well. So there is always this, uh, this, this issue and we should do as many consist, consist, uh, consistency uh, tests or um, self-consistency test or uh, just efficiency tests and uh, whatever kind of statistical tests that we can to make sure that our results actually make sense and they're consistent. And, uh, I have mentioned some of them in the tutorial. So this is another example of the ABC transporter and I only uh, did different calculations for one piece of the trajectory that goes from this inward facing closed to inward facing open and it's a relatively uh, low barrier conformational change and it basically means that this is flexible and that's probably why they, they got two different conformations for it in crystallography. And more interestingly, none of them is the lowest uh, minimum, uh, basically the minimum free energy. The global minimum free energy is actually a different stage, wasn't one of the crystal structures. Interestingly, almost all of the um, crystal structures, the higher resolution crystal structures of ABC exporters that are in the inward facing state are closer to this than the two that uh, are low resolution ones. And again, you can project the free energy, the PMF in, uh, for instance, this is one of the collective, one of the a variable which is related to your collective variable, and this is one which is not related to the collective variable, which counts the number of uh, a certain uh, salt bridge. Like this is a salt bridge that you have two copies of it because it's a homodimer. So you want to know how many of these you have. Uh, here you have only zero, you have one, you have two. So you can have either zero or one or two. Uh, of these salt bridges, you can actually define some smooth variable based on that, and you can project this. And it gives you some information. So this is using, again, the weights that you get from the non-parametric reweighting. Uh, it kind of tells you that this intermediate state, which happens to be a, a, a lower free energy state, uh, typically comes with only one of these salt bridges. Although this is a homodimer, but it doesn't necessarily behave symmetrically. Uh, and of course, it's a homodimer, so it doesn't have to be a particular one which is 
uh, formed and, and the other one broken. Sometimes the you know the one on you know the one on the left is broken. Sometimes the one on the right is broken. But for some reason, the this homodimer prefers some sort of an asymmetric conformation, and this is something that you uh, kind of see uh, in in this uh, space. Now we didn't do anything special about the song bridge. Um, are we allowed to make any statements about this particular behavior that we see here? I would say speculative, because we haven't necessarily sampled this right. It is speculative. Uh, we can make some statements about it, but don't be speculative about them, because we haven't necessarily sampled these, uh, this particular um, degree of freedom correctly, although it looks that it has been sampled, more or less. So one of the uh, things that uh, I need to make this scheme of free energy calculations and pathfinding algorithms um, iterative, especially if I mess up a lot of calculations and I want to use them and don't throw them away, um, is something that uh, I call it a uh, post hoc string method. And I have a standalone code for this, which is an analysis method. So this is not a, uh, a simulation scheme. This is an analysis method. And what is that? It's actually a way of getting a lot of samples that you have gathered from different simulations and extracting, a, again, an approximate minimum free energy path from them. So if you have done bias exchange umbrella sampling, and then you have done re-weighting, so you have a weight associated with each sample, then you project this into a high dimensional space, which could or may or may not be the same as your collective variable space. You can actually add this stuff. Like for instance, um, you can add this um, particular co co uh, reaction coordinate or this particular collective variable to, the, to, this, to this space. So you, you build a new space, a new reduced space, but a large one. And you want to find a, reconstruct a pathway in this space that you have already sampled using one or various simulations before, which is semi-continuous. So that means in every dimension that you put there, if you go from one image to the next, they are almost the same or close to each other. It's not like uh, you jump in different dimensions. So if you want to have a semi-continuous pathway in a particular space, which could be high dimensional, this algorithm helps you using Voronoi tessellation and some other ideas to go from all these samples to a pathway. And that could be an initial pathway for doing more string method type calculations or umbrella sampling, or simply just for uh, making a movie. So you want to, you have done your umbrella sampling, and now you want to make a movie that makes sense. You don't want to jump from one uh, frame to the other, and it looks completely different. You don't want your saltfish to keep breaking and forming. So this actually allows you to do that because with this you generate a pathway which is continuous in those collective variables that you put in your space. Now, is it guaranteed? No, because you may not have enough samples for that. So, but you can give actually weights to different collective variables. You can give weights to different collective variables to guarantee that I want all of these, you know, first 10 collective variables to be definitely continuous, the other ones less important, and so on. So, this is just a way of um, making this iterative in a reasonable manner. And uh, if you do this, then you, you are actually capable of iterating these things and using the, some of the simulations that haven't necessarily been done right. But the samples are, uh, are, are not irrelevant. These are still samples, and you have some weights for them that you may be able to use. And, um, um, this is about the algorithm, that's how it works, but 
uh, let me jump to the example. So this is an example of a bunch of simulations. Um, some of them were related to the binding, some of them related to the transport, some of them had the substrate in them, and some of them didn't have the substrate in them. Um, so, well, I think in this case, all of them had the substrate in them because one of the collective values that I'm projecting is the substrate position. But generally, these are coming from uh, several different simulations, umbrella sampling simulations that have been run independently from each other. And you put everything together, you use the re-weighting and you, the weights that you've got from non-parametric re-weighting, and you project this onto a space. In this case, this is the, one of the principal components, and this is the position of the phosphate in the z-axis. And this is what you get. Now, you want to see that how to generate a pathway to study that more. And uh, you can start with something, like use some algorithm to start with a pathway. Doesn't matter much. And then the post hoc string method uses an iterative way of doing this. Again, it's a non-parametric uh, algorithm, so it's not doing this in a two-dimensional space. It's actually doing it in like a hundred-dimensional space, but we are just seeing the projection. And we see that smoothly it actually goes to a pathway and it stays there. And I haven't actually put a line here. What you see is they just, when they get there, they kind of just move around. So these are all just dots of the samples that you see. So it converges to some pathway that is based on the data available. So it's not necessarily accurate. It's based on the data available. And now you have an actual set of confirmations. Each point in this pathway comes with an actual confirmation. Then you can put together the algorithm, generates a reconstructed trajectory for you. And you can use that trajectory to animate, or you can use it to run some more simulations. And by the way, once it converges, uh, you can see that there is a kind of a sort of a, a transition tube around it. So these are averages of the of the centers, but each um, each center is associated with the number of copies, number of samples. And if you look at it, you see some sort of a these dots now are actual conformations that you see here. So why is this relevant? Because um, this is how I did this project. So I had this <laughs> APO simulations, and I had the binding to the inward spacing structure, and then I had the binding to the outward facing structure, and then I had the transition between the inward facing and outward facing bound. It's very hard to study the whole thing from the beginning. You don't even have most of these. The only thing that you have is this. So I started by doing this, studying this using this methodology, then I, I had now two confirmations for inward and outward, and then I started studying the binding using again the same methodology, and then I started studying this, and again, uh, now I have four different sets of simulations, now I want to combine them. And uh, after doing this one by one, I can now combine them. And the combination uh, can be run at the same time now. So these are all the simulations, the bias exchange on low sampling, the string method uh, simulations, and um, I kind of started the GLPT crystal structure. Do uh, these are I think are string methods. So there are some string methods, some bias exchange on low sampling, and these are the PHSMs. So you kind of use the post hoc string method to go from one step to the other. Sometimes you don't even need to do the string method with swarms if you have enough data and you have a good initial pathway with just the post hoc string method to do the umbrella sampling. So uh, eventually, uh, what's that? Sorry, yeah, so I will just talk a, a couple of minutes about this Riemannian geometry. So just show you the formula. So this is just a regular Landrigan equation. And uh, this is an over damp Landrigan equation. And this is a uh, basically um, the same drift term that you saw before. And uh, this is the diffusion tensor, this is the free energy gradient, and that's a Wiener process, and so on. But, but by free energy gradients, you mean the derivative of PMF? Or, or you mean yeah, so this is actually um, the PMF. So the A or is here the is the PMF of the 
uh, actual system and it's the effective potential energy of the reduced system. So basically, if you assume that in your collective variable space, instead of an actual system with all the atoms, you have now an effective system, which is only described by the dynamics of the collective variables, then there is an effective potential for this system. And this is that potential, which is the same as the PMF of the actual system uh, coordinates in, in that particular collective variable space. But, but as we can hear, this doesn't include Jacobian effects. No. So it's not a potential force. Um, this is a, this is a, this is a diffusion equation. And this is the, the definition you've written here is, is that it contrasts with what Chris showed us a few days ago, right? Including Jacobian terms. So maybe Chris Schiffel can explain. Well, is it, so to, the, the derivative of that. Yeah. The gradient that is not the mean force necessarily. Right. Is, is, does that is that does that is that, is that at odds with the definition of, of the Alonzo equation? Or I, I don't actually know. Uh, no, this is the this is the the, the definition of Lantern equation. It, so it doesn't matter if, if if it's strictly the mean force or does it? Um. So maybe maybe Chris can comment on that. The way he's defined the potential mean force yes. is using a, a delta potential as an expectation value, which is a kind of unmotivated thing to, to define because it, it omits the Jacobian factors, which depend on uh, what coordinate you are taking the, for, the force with respect to. So if you were to take the derivative of that equation, you would not necessarily get the mean force unless the Jacobian of your coordinate vanishes, or is constant, rather. Ah, uh, so that's, yeah, that's the, uh, and, and I know this, we did, yeah, that I forgot to discuss in, uh, in my own, uh, in my this, own lecture, that this, the story of this high Jacobian and not high Jacobian. But we have like this, it's too bad that Jacobian is not here. Uh, but actually, he mentioned it. So we have like this statistical, the statistical, the, the probabilistic uh, definition of the of the potential of mean force, and uh, the more classical one. So the classical one is the one that you find in textbook. If you take the book of David Chandler, and it says the potential of mean force equals minus kt log of t of r. So t of r the rate of the G of R converges towards 1 when R tends towards infinity. Therefore, W of R converges towards 0 when R tends to that variance with the probabilistic definition of the potential of mean force, which at long distance should tend toward minus infinity. Right? Uh, and this is what we use actually when we when we do uh, this protein moving binding thing, because as a prefactor, we have this, this integral of r to the square sine theta dr d theta phi. Do not double count the Jacobian term. Right? Am I making sense here? Yeah, so this is actually the, uh, the uh, if, if you, I mean, right now what I'm writing is actually an defective, okay. uh, yeah. basic reduced system, but if you want to relate this to the potential of mean force, it is the minus kVt log of basically the, uh, the ensemble average of delta. So that, I think there are caveats in that statement, and I just I, I don't know if this if, if what follows hinges on those caveats or not. So I mean, right? I, yeah, I, we can we can. If we're just really a conversation, we can. Continue. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, but this is basically just a standard way of writing the the Lantern equation, and uh, this is called the drift term, and that's the the noise and so on. 
And uh, yeah, and this is the basically the definition for the uh, potential of the force. But um, again, the comments I made that the strain method would give you the zero drift, which makes this a zero along the path, rather than gives you giving you the minimum free energy path, but it should be parallel to this. So your strain method is parallel to this, rather than parallel to the free energy uh, gradient. Now, and also you have the, uh, uh, the you have the probabilistic uh, version of it, which is important, especially if you want to uh, estimate, for instance, the diffusion tensor uh, in a uh, Bayesian um, manner. Um, but basically what it means is because you have the probability of things happening after your simulation, you can kind of reconstruct the free energy and the diffusion constant from the Potter Planck equation as well. But uh, the Riemannian version is equivalent to the Euclidean version. So this is, this is an equivalent equation to what I just showed. The only difference is there is no D uh, as a tensor in it. There is no position dependent diffusion tensor in it. Instead, you have a, just a scalar position independent diffusion constant. And all the information uh, about the metric is in the gradient here, which is defined uh, like this using the uh, Riemannian geometry formula for gradient. And uh, then there is a additional drift term that you can call it the geometric drift term because it's only related to the metric and its derivatives. So these crystal uh, symbols are related to derivatives of metric. So this is all metric dependent and this is all free energy dependent. Um, so the interesting thing about it is this term is invariant under coordinate transformations. So although it looks very much similar to the previous formula here, the difference is here, uh, none of these two, actually I need to go one more back. So here, none of these two terms are uh, invariant under Fourier transformations. It has certain things mixed up. Now, if you go to the Riemannian geometry, and what is the point of going to Riemannian geometry? In Riemannian geometry, things are invariant under Fourier transformation. It tells you how to do certain things, like geodesic distance. Geodesic distance is invariant under Fourier transformation. Cartesian distance is not invariant under Fourier transformation. Free energy, as defined here, which is similar to the, um, uh, or potential of being force. If you define the potential of being force the same way, but use the Riemannian definition of the Dirac delta function, rather than the Cartesian definition of Dirac delta function, which does include the information about metric. So it's, it's the same definition, but you just use Riemannian ways of doing it. And it becomes invariant under Fourier transformation. Now, you don't actually have the Jacobian or anything like that. So there is no need for dealing with Jacobian anymore. What is What you have instead is the metric. So metric has the same type of information. It's a slightly different context, though, because Jacobian is for transformation. Here, metric is something intrinsically in the system. So in, in whatever, you have kind of an abstract space, which doesn't have any particular coordinate, uh, uh, particular expression for its coordinates. Uh, only locally you express things in terms of certain coordinates. And uh, when you express things locally, you can also have metric tensors locally. So it's a different framework. It, it gives a geometric interpretation of things. But the nice thing about it is it has things have a nicer meaning. Now, this term is actually the gradient of free energy, a free energy which is invariant. And its gradient is also invariant. This term here is only related to your, the way that you are defining your coordinates locally. And it's not invariant. Because the way that you observe the movement of your trajectory locally is not invariant. It depends on how you look at it, how you project it. 
So this has that information, and then this has more interesting information because it's about the real uh, physical meaning of a pathway. So you have a physical pathway which is invariant under Fourier transformations. And it doesn't change going from one to another. And I'm, I'm just going to show you one example. Um, I'm not going to talk about all of this, except one formula that I talked about before. And this is the formula. So there is an exact relationship between the potential of mean force defined using Riemannian framework and the perturbed free energy. So the perturbed free energy and, and, and the potential of mean force are related by this uh, function, which is a complicated one. And this is the uh, Laplace Beltrami operator, uh, which is the Riemannian version of Laplacian. But this is an exact relation. You can prove it mathematically. So um, Homer, actually, Gerhard Homer, uh, showed the one-dimensional version of it before, in 2010. He proved the one-dimensional version of this, of this. But then, when I, when I wanted to generalize this to multi-dimensions, I realized that you have to do this in the Riemannian framework. There is no way that you can actually generalize this in the Cartesian framework. So to really relate the PMF to free energy, you need to deal with that in the Riemannian framework. And uh, just an example, uh, let me show you this example. This is like a little peptide, uh, methamphetamine. So you do string method with storms of trajectories, and you do umbrella sampling with this, using the same techniques that we talked about before, between two states. A, like an extended state and a, um, like a beta term state. So the blue one um, is the conventional Euclidean Cartesian string method of sorts of trajectories in the dihedral angle space. So dihedral angles are not Cartesian coordinates anymore. And their geometry is not Cartesian anymore, but we typically deal with that as Cartesian. Uh, but they're not Cartesian. And if you use dihedral angles to do your free energy calculations for this system, this is the path that you get, and that's the free energy you get, using the same approach that I just talked about. Now, if you use Riemannian implementation, so you define your distances using geodesic distances, and you define your metric using basically a metric estimation. And you get a different pathway and a different free energy kind of looks similar, but it's not the same. The pathway is also not the same. You get different intermediates. Now, what's the good thing about the Riemannian one? Which one is actually correct? So change your coordinates. Instead of doing this in the dihedral space, I've uh, projected them in the dihedral principal component, which is doing principal component dihedral. So I've projected it here, but the collective variables used were dihedral angles themselves. Now, if you actually do the calculations in dihedral, principal component itself. So now I use the collective variables that are different from the previous one. I redo all the calculations with dihedral principal components as my collective variables. And again, project this in the, in the first three uh, dihedral principal components. So the blue one that you see here um, is uh, basically the dihedral based uh, conventional one, and the dotted blue one is the DPC conventional one. So you actually get a completely different pathway, and a completely different free energy, when instead of using dihedral angles directly, you use the dihedral angle principal components. So which one is correct? Probably neither of them. Now, if you do Riemannian way, the red one, you get a slightly different pathway, but it's quite close. So you still get errors because uh, none of the metric estimates are actually accurate. They're all estimates. So you do on the fly metric estimation. So, um, but the pathway that you get is quite similar, and the free energy that you get is also quite similar. There are some differences, but not a fundamental, but the blue one, the conventional one, is completely different.
So that is why having an invariant uh, method is important, because that's the first thing that you need to make sure, that if you change your coordinate system just a little bit, you're not going, because this is the same thing, you're just using the dihedral angles again. It's just a linear combination of the sine and cosine of the dihedral angles, so you shouldn't get a completely different pathway. But you do, again, you do get a different pathway, and that's a big, big flaw. And the Riemannian formalism helps to deal with that. Now, the orientation quaternion is good because uh, the way it's already implemented is Riemannian, and it has a very good approximation for the geodesic distance. So you don't need to deal with that. You don't need to worry, worry about that. It will be invariant by definition. But like dihedral angles, they are not. OK, so that's it. <laughs> I think it was just on time. Yeah. Uh, so I know I noticed here that the the conventional um, pathway that looks like it always has a higher free energy. Is that is that a pattern that holds, or is that just a, a quirk of this example? Oh uh, well, I've only done this for this system so far, okay. and also in the, the this toy model which is just the Muller potential. <laughs> yeah. So the, the blue one, yeah, it's slightly higher. So maybe there is a reason for it. Well, I wonder if that's related to the fact that if you don't have a correct dividing surface, you should yeah. always overestimate the barrier. Yeah, it's, it's possible. I haven't thought about it. But yeah, good observation. All right, thank you.